So we're moving now into theological anthropology, which is the study of what it means to be human. And in lots of different contexts, you'll hear the word anthropology. Of course, we think of anthropologists as those who go and study um, different groups of, of people. Uh, you know, you think about anthropologists out in the Amazon studying uh, native tribes. You hear of anthropologists who are uh, reflecting on on so society and how humans organize themselves, political anthropology, these kinds of things. What we're talking about here is theological anthropology. And so I want to define theological anthropology to make sure that we are all uh, kind of on the same page of, of what we mean when we use this language. Theological anthropology is defined as follows. The study of human nature as created by God in its sinful state of rebellion against God and as restored by God through redemption and renewal. So the uh, adjective theological is very important here. We're, we're talking specifically about humanity within the frame of humanity as intended by God, as created by God, also what has happened to us when we have rebelled against God and what God has done in order to restore us to himself through his son Jesus Christ. So these are kind of the, the broad themes that we're going to be looking at. Now kind of to focus in a little bit more on exactly what it is that, that we're going to be doing in this lecture and then the next lecture, how we're going to be approaching theological anthropology. We're going to be looking at it in four stages. Um, what we're going to look at in this lecture is the imago Dei, the, the image of God. What does it mean for humans to be created in the image of God? And then the rebellion, what has happened when humans have rebelled against God? What has that done to our being human? How has that shaped us? How has that changed us? How can we understand what it means to be human as those who are in rebellion against God? And then in the next lecture, we're going to look at Jesus, the true human, uh, looking at, at Christ from the lens of, of theological anthropology, which of course doesn't negate the lens of Christ as divine, but we, we are going to look a bit more at the, the human side of Christ and, and what that means um, it, for our understanding of what it means to be human. And then we're going to close with uh, reflections on the Holy Spirit, thinking about sanctification in its anthropological frame. What is it that's happening in us, to us, through us, by the work of of the Holy Spirit. So that's the, the movement that uh, we're going to be undergoing over the next couple of lectures. Um, so now we're going to begin with the image of God, the Imago Dei. So what does it mean to be created in the image of God? We hear this language a lot. Um, uh, I, I think there are people in the church who understand or, or at least know that this is, you know, a pretty important part of what we talk about when we talk about what it means to be human. But um, I want to dig in to what it means to be created in the image of God, because I think particularly in Western Christianity, uh, we have had a vision of this that I'm not sure has uh, been particularly helpful for us um, to grasp truly biblically what it is that that um, is going on in the scriptures when it talks about what it means to be the image of God. So I just want to do a very broad overview of some of the, the, the teaching in, the we in Western theology on the image of God, and then um, think about how maybe the, 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 the tradition of Eastern Orthodoxy can help us to uh, have a what I think is a better biblical picture of what it means to be created in the image of God. Okay, so Genesis 1 is obviously a foundational text when it comes to reflecting on the image of God. In Genesis 1, uh, towards the end of the chapter, uh, after we have read about all that God has done to create, uh, he then uh, create the, the created world, he then creates the uh, the human, and I'm opening up my Bible here to Genesis 1, uh, verses 26 and following. It says, Then God said, Let us make 
mankind, humanity in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So what we read in Genesis 1 is that there is something uh, that is unique about human beings, right? In, in, in the, the first days of creation, as we talked about when we were talking about um, God as creator, there's this pattern of this kind of poetic narrative, uh, this poetic poem that's going on about what's going on with uh, God's creation, that God is creating uh, by, by saying, uh, let there be light, uh, or then God said, and it was so, right? We have this, these repeated patterns, then God said, and it was so. You don't have that pattern. The pattern breaks when it comes to God's creation of humanity. We kind of focus in, you know, as, as if there was a, a, a movie and you had a kind of a broad view and then it panned in, it honed in, it zoomed in on what's going on with humanity. So there's something unique going on in the creation of human beings. There's something in us that uniquely reflects the nature of God, and that's not the case of any other created being. It's not the case of the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the animals, the trees, the mountains. None of these are declared to be created in God's image. Thinking of this as a parental analogy, there is something in us that means that we look like our divine parent. That we, in a unique way, are his offspring who belong to his family. And certainly the, the whole of the creation is, of course, a part of God's work, and it's under his sovereign lordship. But there is something about humanity that's being declared here is unique. I think what this is saying is that as those who are created in God's image, humankind, humanity, we are uniquely connected to the nature of God. We uniquely reflect the being of God in the way that no other part of the creation reflects. No other part of the creation is connected to the nature of God in the way that we are. How? How is it that we are connected to the image of God? In the, the history of theology, one of the ways that this has been discussed is through the, the logos, the way that uh, we have reason and rationality. So Nana Harrison uh, writes this, God's word, God's speech, it's discourse and self-expression, as well as God's rationality that creates structures and governs the universe in an orderly way. Is how she defines logos, that God's logos, his word, his speech, that enters into humanity when he creates us. Right? And it's, it's God's rationality, the way that he orders, orders the universe, governs the universe in a, in a very particular way, that that rationality has then been given to us. And in the Western tradition, this idea of rationality as the image of God has been a very central part of how theologians have understood Imago Dei, that, that humans, as those who are created in God's image, are those who are endowed with rationality. And that's certainly true, and there is certainly something unique about human rationality, human consciousness. This is uh, There's very interesting conversations going on in neuroscience these days about what it is that consciousness is. It's understood that this is something unique about human beings. And in kind of evolutionary neuroscience, um, scientists haven't figured out where rationality comes from and, and why it is that, that human beings have this endowment of rationality consciousness, whereas no other members of the animal kingdom do. 
And I think from a theological perspective, we can say that this uniqueness is our being in the image of God in the way that no other creature is. So we participate in Christ's character as Logos. We participate in God's life through our rationality. And as I said, in the, in the Western tradition, this has been a very important part of understanding what it means to be human. But also in the Western tradition, this has been defined individually. Imago Dei is an individual concept. And, and at the heart of this is the influence of St. Augustine, who wrote a book called De Trinitate, which means on, on the Trinity. And in that book, On the Trinity, he is reflecting on what it means to be humans who are created in the image of God. And he takes this kind of what we can call a tripartite view of, of humanity, that, that individual humans reflect the image of God through a certain quote-unquote triunity within us. And Augustine defines this as soul, spirit, and mind, uh, that, that these three parts of us reflect the, the image of God. He also describes body, intellect, and will as the three parts of humanity of, of individual humans that reflect the image of God, that reflect the Trinity. And the focus here is on the rational, willing individual as the image of God. And so in the Western tradition has been this view that we need to find the image of God in individuals. And we could get into a, a, a long extended reflection here on Western individuality and how Western individuality that has played itself out in all kinds of ways in the West, capitalism, liberal democracy, these kinds of things are, are rooted in this focus on the individual that we find going all the way back to Augustine and the image of God. And again, I want to say that I, I believe that our rationality is an essential part of our being the in, in created in the image of God, but I don't believe that it is the core of what it means for us to be in the image of God. I think in order to, to really find the core of what it means to be in the image of God, we need to look away from the Western tradition and towards the Eastern tradition. And there's a lot about Eastern Orthodoxy that I don't agree with. I'm not an Eastern Orthodox believer myself. Um, but I think on this understanding of image of God, I believe that the Eastern Orthodox view has resources that we need in the West. So in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, the Imago Dei is viewed in relational terms. So rationality and creativity are included. We are these, but we are rational and creative beings as essentially relational beings. So what Eastern Orthodoxy emphasizes about what it means to be human is that essential relationality that is not part of the Western view. Of course, the Western view would say that we are relational beings, but even you know, thinking about the, the Western political tradition, if you go into the political philosophers at the root of Western liberalism, like Thomas Hobbes and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, they had this idea of the state of nature. And in the state of nature, what we were naturally as human beings to be, we were individuals. And then we, we lived in social groupings through the social contract and coming together and making deals with one another. But there's not an essential relationality in that way of looking. And that's been consistent in the West. In the East, there is this essential relationality that we can only understand what it means to be human if we understand that humans are relational beings. At the very nature of what it means to be human is to be relational not individuals who then form societies and groups, but we are fundamentally relational. And if in the Eastern tradition, this is essential to the Imago Dei because there is a strong emphasis on the doctrine of the Trinity and how the doctrine of the Trinity is what is being imaged in humanity. In other words, we are 
essentially relational beings because the God that we image is essentially relational. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. So our Trinitarian theology that we've been looking at over the last uh, few lectures is vitally important for us when we think about what it means to be created in the image of God. Because the image, that, the, the God that we are imaging is the God who is triune. And so when I, I read in Genesis 1, God creates humankind in his image, it says that he created them, male and female, he created them. He creates Adam, the human, and that the human is male and female. So in this, in this uh, very important sense, we can see that it's the relationality of human beings, male and female, that is the closest image that we have to the divine life on the earth. And this is what it is that humans foundationally, how it is that we foundationally image the triune God. God is one God in three persons. Humanity is Ha'adam, the human, as male and female. In our relationality as male and female, we image the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so I, I, I think that it's, it's vitally important for us to reflect on this because the individualism of the Western tradition has impacted the way that we understand ourselves, how we understand, therefore, what it means to be in the image of God. So effectively, what this is saying is I, me, Joel, the individual, I don't image God myself by myself. We, as a community of male and female, image God. And in Genesis 1, of course, God unites male and female in marriage, and that is uh, the foundational relationship that images God. So we see here in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, I think, resources that can help us to understand better what it means to be human and overcome some of the Western individualism that has been so much a, a, a part of the church's understanding of what it means to be human. And this has significant effects as we move forward in our understanding about what it means to be human. If to be human is to image God relationally, because we are essentially relational beings and because God is essentially a relational being, then that has to shape our understanding of what it means for us to be human. And, and foundationally, though we're not covering this topic in this course, we'll, we'll touch on it a bit in the next lecture, but then you'll cover it more in TS 513. Foundationally, then, it also has to do with what we understand the church to be. Is the church a collection of individuals, or is the church a unique community whose very life is the image of God on earth? And how we answer that question has incredibly important uh, impact on our understanding of the church and the church's mission and our own uh, life in community with others in God's church. But again, like I said, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit next week, and then in TS 513, you will cover the church. Okay, so how does a relational view of, of Imago Dei shape our vision of, of what it means to be human? How does it shape our vision of what sin is? How does it shape our vision of what redemption is? These are what we're going to kind of be tracking these questions as we move through the the course. So what does it mean to be human in the Imago Dei? I would like to propose that what it means to be human is to be free. Of course, as immediately as I say that, a question should come to your mind. And that question should be, well, what does it mean to be free? And particularly, what does it mean for contingent, created beings to be 
free, because we're talking about human freedom. And what we are as humans is we are contingent. We are dependent upon others for our creation. We don't choose being alive. We don't come to that decision ourselves and say, you know what, I, I do want to be a human. Um, and, and I, and I want to be born in this time and I want to be born in this place and I want to be born to these parents and I want to be born in this socioeconomic position and I want to be born to my, my parents doing these, this line of work or, or whatever it might be. We don't have those options. We don't have those choices. We are contingent. We are created. And so what does it mean for us as people who are contingent and created beings to be free? Because it certainly doesn't mean that we have libertarian freedom, that we can choose to be whatever we want, that we can choose to live however we want. We are contingent. We are created. There is built into our being free limitation. And we're going to talk about how freedom and limitation aren't dichotomous from one another. In fact, biblically, freedom and limitation uh, coincide, and they're at the heart of what it means for us to be free. So how does placing freedom at the center of what it means to be human shape our vision of our core identity as those who are created in the image of God? Okay, so what does it mean to be free? I think if we went out and you went out and wherever wherever you are and, and you started wandering around the streets and asking people, hey, what, what, what does it mean to be free? there would be lots of different answers that people give, but they could probably be boiled down to a, a particular theme. And that theme is freedom from. That freedom is the removal of limits. Freedom is the absence of imposed responsibility. Stuff I didn't choose. Removing all of that stuff I don't choose away from me. Freedom is the ability then to choose without hindrance, that I have the options that I want to have and I can choose those options as I want to choose those options. So this is a, a view of freedom that is a freedom from, it's a freedom from imposition, it's a freedom from hindrance, it's a freedom from uh, those things that are, are foisted upon me. Is this what it means to be free? This is what it means to be free in America. This is how Americans define freedom. This is how the West defines freedom. But is this how the scriptures define freedom? How does the scripture portray what it means for contingent and created beings to be free? Like in scripture, you have the opposite of what you have in an American view of freedom and in a Western view of freedom. In the scriptures, you have the notion of freedom for. And that freedom for is very specifically defined in scripture. And that freedom for is defined in scripture by the great commandment of God. To be free for means to be human, humans who are free to love God and to love our neighbor. As we are called to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself, that is freedom. Freedom is the ability to love God and to love neighbor. That is not a freedom from imposition. That is not a freedom from obligation, from responsibility, from limits. That is a freedom for that is defined by obligation and limits and responsibilities. The responsibilities of loving God. The responsibilities of loving neighbor. That in that we find freedom. So we are created to be those who reflect God's self-giving love in community with others. Because at the heart of what it means to be God is to be a God of self-giving, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
seek to give themselves to each other, seek the good and the glory of the other through their own self-donation, their own self-gift to the other. And that's essential to what the one God, the, the, the nature of the one God is. And so for us to be created and to be those who in our relationality reflect God's self self-giving love in community with others. In other words, to be human is to be free to give ourselves as a gift to others. And again, this is the greatest commandment in the second. And it's in this that we see the theological anthropology is reflective of Trinitarian relationality. The life of God is a life of self-giving to other in community. The life of humanity, we who are created in the image of God, is to be the life of self-giving for the sake of the other, in community with the other. This is how we were created to image God, that the image of the Trinity would be seen on the earth. This is the will of God, that his own nature would be seen on the earth in the human relationality of male and female, in fellowship with one another, in self-giving community with each other. Now, of course, something desperately went wrong with all of that. We rebelled against God. We rebelled against what he defined for us. We rebelled against the limits of God. And we have sought to find freedom through our own independence and self-direction. That has brought desperate consequences to humanity, to human relationality, to human political order, to the environment, to relationships between male and female. And all of that is because we have refused to live our life as we are created to live it under the freedom that God created for us and instead sought to define our own freedom. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. How are we free? What does it mean for us to be free, to live that freedom? What we see in the first couple chapters of Genesis is that humanity is free through the divine command, through the divine word. God speaks. And humanity is to listen to God's word and to obey God's word. So the purpose of divine command, what is it? What is the purpose of God's word? What is the purpose of God's speech? You know, that we have said a number of times in this course is there is no theology without divine speech. Well, what is the purpose of divine command? Well, we see in the first couple of chapters of Genesis that God gives negative Thou shalt not, thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and positive commands, thou shalt be fruitful and multiply, eat of all of the trees in the garden. The purpose of divine word, the purpose of divine command is to guide the human to relational union with God and with neighbor through loving self-giving. In other words, God's command, it's not a test, it's not a, a, uh, a laying on of burden. The word of God, the command of God, the speech of God is to guide humanity in how to be human, to guide humanity in how to live out the life that God has created for us to live. In other words, the command of God is the, the means, it's the guide to human thriving. It's the, the, the grace of God to declare to us where there is life and how to live in the life that God created for us to live. And if we trust it, and if we obey it, 
And if we sit under it, then God's command will lead us to thriving. But if we reject it, if we disobey it, if we decide that we can determine for ourselves our own thriving, there are desperate consequences. Now this leads us to thinking about limits and limitation, what I call here the freedom of limitation. The Imago Dei as a relational concept puts before us the question of limits. Because by nature, as contingent created beings, we are limited. There are things we can't do. There are things we can't choose for ourselves. We live within bodies. We live within the laws of the universe. We live within particular places and times. Those things limit us. The image of God as a relational concept puts before us this question of limits. And what it declares to us is that humanity is only free within the boundaries that are set for us by our Creator. To be free for others means inevitably to be limited by the other or by others. That when, when Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, Adam and Eve's relationship by its very nature was a limiting relationship. They were in a covenant relationship with God. They were in a covenant relationship with each other. And that covenant relationship was limiting. They were in a marital relationship with one another, and that brings limitations with it. That brings boundaries to it. But what we don't understand, what we don't believe as those who have rebelled against God and are on the other side of the rebellion, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, is that those limitations are the actual uh, way to thriving and to life. Freedom for contingent beings means that we aren't free to do our own will. And I think this is very problematic, the conversations that we have theologically about, about free will. I think free will as a concept is deeply flawed. It's not a biblical concept, the way that we talk about it. We talk about it philosophically. We talk about it in kind of this... Um, modernist philosophical way of uh, of our own ability to choose what we want and it's a very kind of uh, western liberal democracy kind of a way of looking at the freedom of the will it's rooted in an anthropology that's not consistent with christian anthropology freedom for us as contingent beings means that we aren't free to do our own will in other words, what Adam and Eve were created to do was not live according to their own will. They were created with will, but the choice for them wasn't to choose between the various options of what their will desired. The choice for them was whether they were going to do God's will or whether they were going to follow their own will. See, the freedom that we have been created to have is the freedom for choosing to do God's will, not the freedom to choose what our will chooses. So we are called to will God's will. There's a freedom in that. We're not forced to do it. Adam and Eve weren't forced to obey God's will. Adam and Eve were called to obey God's will, but they had the choice whether to obey God's will or whether to obey their own will. And Adam and Eve and humanity is only free when we will to will God's will. See, so as created beings, then, we are determined. We are bound to God. We are bound to his will. Our freedom is in choosing to, is in choosing to do his will, not our own will. And so because of this, it's important for us to note that freedom and determination are not dichotomous for humans. They coincide in our contingency as willing agents. 
We are free when we are determined. We are free when we are limited. We are free when there are boundaries and we accept those boundaries and we live in those boundaries and we will, we choose to live according to the will of God and the boundaries that he has created for us, rather than seeking to cast off those boundaries in order to find some kind of a promised libertarian freedom, where we then get to choose and be the agents of our own lives, where we then get to be those who are in charge of our own lives. That is not what it means to be human. As we're going to see, that's what it means to be in bondage to sin. So to summarize, we are only free when we obey. We are only free when we obey. And obedience is living within the limits placed on us by God's command, by the presence of the other, loving God and loving neighbor. We are only free when we live consistent with our contingency, As created beings, we are only free when we live under the word of God. We are only free when we will to will God's will. And we lose that freedom when we will to will our own will and to seek our own way and our own thriving according to our own resources. And that's what we turn to next as we turn to the rebellion. In Genesis 3, we see Adam and Eve's disobedience against God. And I encourage you, take take a minute here, pause the lecture, go and and, and read Genesis 3. Um, And just take a few minutes and read through and reflect on Genesis 3 and then come back to the lecture and and we're going to think together about what's going on here in Genesis chapter 3. Now, I want you to notice here that I call this the rebellion. Oftentimes, you will hear it called the fall, the fall of humanity in Genesis 3. I don't like that language because it feels kind of passive to me, like, oops, I tripped and fell. I think what we actually see in Genesis 3 is something that's much more active. It's an act of rejection. It's an act of rebellion. And this act of rejection, this act of rebellion, uh, brings with it a deep relational chasm that opens up between humanity and humanity and God that really is the taproot of what human sinfulness is, and the results of human sinfulness is that broken relationship with God, which means if the image of God is essentially relational, because what the God that we image is essentially relational, then at the heart of what human sin is, it's the, the breakdown of the imago Dei, and it's the chasm that breaks, uh, that, that, that breaks into our relationship with God and with neighbor. So sin is fundamentally then not an individual concept. Sin is a relational concept. Okay, so let's dig into this. At the heart of the temptation account of the serpent, if you read through Genesis 3, right, the serpent comes to Adam and Eve, uh, did God really say, right? So he questions the word of God. He questions the guidance of God. And at the heart of that, did God really say that you shouldn't eat from the trees in the garden? What, as Eve responds to that, Eve says, well, God did say that we can't, can't eat from the trees in the garden, but we are not to eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. Uh, it says in verse 3, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. To which the serpent responds, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. So at the heart of the temptation of the serpent is is putting this desire in Adam and Eve's heart to be like God. Sicut Deus is the Latin for like God. That's the heart of this temptation. Hey, you know what? You can be better. You can be more enlightened. You can be more knowledgeable. You can be more understanding. You can be like God. Right? This is the promise that the serpent makes to Adam and Eve. There's a better life for you. God is holding out on you. 
there's a better existence, there's a higher existence. You don't have to be determined by what God wants you to be. If you um, become like God, you can determine yourself. You don't have to live under his rule. You don't have to live under his reign. There is something much, much better for you. And so the serpent questions the nature of God, puts doubt in the heart of Adam and Eve about the character of God, about the love of God, causes them to doubt God's plan for them, God's goodness, God's lordship over them. Now, when the serpent describes this, you can be like God he defines very particularly what it would mean for Adam and Eve to be like God. Remember what that is? He defines it. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. And then he says what this will mean, knowing good and evil. I think this is fascinating. I think this is vitally important to our understanding of what it means for humans to be in rebellion against God. And I don't think the church generally understands what our human rebellion really is. Because we don't really understand what our human rebellion really is, I don't think the church really understands what sin is. We have tended to approach sin behaviorally. We have tended to approach sin from the concept of morality. We have tended to approach sin from the concept of right and wrong. And I think all of that misses what's going on biblically around the nature of what sin truly is. And I think because we've missed this, and because we've been telling the wrong story of sin, I think this has gotten the church into a great deal of trouble where we have sought to be the moral arbiters of society. We are not meant to be the moral arbiters of society, because as we're going to see, I think morality is the result of human fallenness. We are meant to be something else entirely, but if we don't understand what sin really is, if, we don't, if we're not telling the right story of sin, then I think that means we're not telling the right story of the gospel. And, and, and the church, I just, this burdens me deeply. I think the church is caught in all kinds of things that we aren't to be caught in because we don't know the story of sin. So I want to really stress this and encourage you to think deeply about this, about what this is, what is really going on here in Genesis chapter 3. Okay, so defining what it means to be like God, the serpent says, knowing good and evil. Now this is very interesting. What does that mean? Well, that means that before the rebellion... Humanity didn't live according to the knowledge of good and evil. Before the rebellion, we didn't know good and evil. We didn't have that knowledge. That was the knowledge that is symbolized by the tree. And the taking of the fruit and eating the, tr the fruit is ingesting this knowledge of good and evil that we didn't have prior to doing that. So prior to the rebellion... We didn't live according to knowledge of good and evil because we didn't know good and evil. We didn't have that knowledge. So what is it that we did know? What, what, what was human knowledge of prior to this rebellion? What is it that we knew? We knew God. We were in direct fellowship, immediate relationship with God. And as those who were in direct fellowship and in immediate relationship with God, we were in dialogue with God, and we knew the command of God. We knew the word of God. We knew what God had said. We knew God's speech, God's guidance. We knew God. We didn't know good and evil. Instead, we knew God. So this means that human beings weren't created to live according to the knowledge of good and evil. See, at the heart of the serpent's temptation, be like God, knowing good and evil, what's, what he's really saying there is you can determine for yourselves how to live your life. 
you can be in charge of your own life. You can be autonomous. You can be free. Free from God. Free from God's control over you. Free from these nasty rules that God has placed on you. These arbitrary things that God has put in place. Free from these limits that God has created around you. There's a better life. You can be in charge of your own life. You can have your own self-command. You can have your own self-identity. You can determine for yourself who you are, what you are. Your self-command can be at the heart of your life. And what happens with that, then, is when human beings ingest the knowledge of good and evil, our self-command does replace God's command. Our understanding of what it means, of what good and evil means, replaces God's word. At the heart of this is a rejection of God. It's the rejection of God as God. We don't trust God. We don't believe that God is good. We reject God. And as those who have rejected God, we have become our own gods. We have become lords of our own life. We have become gods of ourselves. Then we've done all of that through taking on the knowledge of good and evil, by which we seek to become self-determining agents, not living under the word of God and the command of God, because we have come to believe that that is a burden and oppressive. Rather, we're going to be in charge ourselves. We're going to determine for ourselves how we want to live our life through this capacity that we now have, which is knowing good and evil. I believe that morality is rooted in the rebellion of humanity against God. And so here's what I, I mean by this. When we think about what morality, morality, and we, we tell we, we teach our children to be moral and we, we teach people in church to be moral in this kind of a thing. What we usually mean by that is there's a right and there's a wrong. And you need to determine that right and that wrong, and you need to do the right, and you need not do the wrong. We believe that there is this innate knowledge of right and wrong that is within us that God created for us to, to live by. Well, I don't think any of that squares with Genesis chapter 3. Here's how I de determine morality. Morality is the human project in rebellion against God of self-determination of our actions based on our knowledge of good and evil. See, we, we do now have this sense of right and wrong within us. That's true. But what I don't think is true is that God created that. And God intended that. I don't think humans were created to live with the knowledge of right and wrong. I don't think that we were created to try to navigate life based on our own determination of right versus wrong, of good and evil. That's not the life of freedom. That's not the life that we were created to have of constantly trying to navigate life of what's the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. And now society with all of our different visions of what the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do is to try to organize a society based on the knowledge of good and evil. All of that is the burden of our rebellion against God. Morality is the burden of our rebellion against God. What we were created to do was to live in the freedom of choosing to obey God's word and so trust in him. That is freedom. To live in the, under the word of God and to allow that word to guide our steps, to guide our lives, not having that knowledge of good and evil ourselves, but trusting in God's knowledge and trusting in God's character that what he tells us and how he guides us is the way to, to truth and to goodness. Because God is the one who knows the good, because God is the good. God knows God's self. And if we know God deeply, 
and we walk in relationship with him, then we know the good because God is the good. But we don't have this independent knowledge of good and evil that now we have to live by. What we know is God. That's what we were created to know. And his command is given to guide us to the good because it guides us to life with him. Okay, so morality is the rebellious human condition. In other words, the problem of sin isn't that we are immoral. The problem of sin is that we are moral. That we now have the knowledge of good and evil by which we have to determine for ourselves the right and the wrong and try to navigate life according to the right and the wrong by our own knowledge of good and evil. All of which separates us from God. Morality is what separates us from God. Because now, rather than obeying God, rather than being in direct fellowship with God and walking closely with him and living according to his word, now we have chosen to be like God, knowing good and evil, disobedient in our moral self-determination, the result of which is separation from God. It is our morality that separates us from God. Not our immorality. It's our morality that separates us from God. What's the result of this? And we'll conclude the lecture here by reflecting on the results of this rebellion. One is the creation of conscience. Again, I think we think that conscience is something that we are supposed to have, that God created for us to have, right? This the inner sense of what is right or wrong in one's conduct or motives impelling one toward right action. Right? This is the definition, the dictionary definition of conscience. Inner sense of what is right and wrong in one's conduct or motives. The problem with that is that's the result of our rebellion. It's not intended by God. It's not created by God. Conscience comes from the uh, word, or breaks down to con, with, and, and science, scientia, with knowledge, right? With the knowledge of, of good and evil. We weren't created to, to have that knowledge. We weren't created to have conscience. Conscience is a result of our rebellion. Conscience is what happens when we move from having a prayerful dialogue with God to having now an inner dialogue with the self by which we live according to the knowledge of good and evil. So I, I say um, when I as I teach this, that, that conscience is the opposite of prayer. Okay, we were supposed to live prayerful lives, i.e. lives in, in relationship with God, constantly aware of his presence with us and constantly attuned to that presence. But now the conscience, rather than being in dialogue with God, now we have turned into a dialogue with ourself about what's the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. This is classically illustrated by the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder debating with us about what it is that we ought to do. Conscience is this inner dialogue with ourselves that we were never meant to have because we we're created to be external people from healthy selves directed outwardly towards God and towards neighbor. Now we have been turned in on ourselves and that turn in on ourselves creates the conscience. We see shame immediately take hold of Adam and Eve. The recognition of our break in our relationship with God and neighbor, that's what shame is, a recognition that, that, that we have uh, broken this fellowship with God, we have broken this fellowship with neighbor. And that now has brought destructive consequences to our relationships. The third is this idea of being turned in on the self, the core curvum in say, which is the Latin for the heart turned in on itself, right? We were meant to be hearts that were directed away from the self towards God and towards neighbor. Now the heart has turned in on itself. Martin Luther uses this language of kind of the, the, the bent, the bending in toward ourselves uh, where we are now hunched inwardly rather than faced outwardly. And the self and not God is at the center of our lives. And that is deeply destructive to humanity and to human relationships. We lose our neighbor. The neighbor no longer is the object of my freely given love, 
Now the neighbor becomes my enemy or the neighbor becomes my competition. And what we see immediately following Genesis chapter 3 in Genesis chapter 4 is violence. Right? The violence of, uh, uh, of Cain and Abel, the violence of competition, the violence of relational breakdown, the violence of relational destruction. And violence, of course, is not simply physical violence. Violence takes place in all manner of human relationships, from manipulation to uh, verbal abuse to mental abuse to physical abuse, all kinds of different ways that violence plays out in the human condition. This is what happens when the neighbor no longer is the object of my self-gift, but now the neighbor becomes a competitor with me. To be dead is to be disconnected from the life of God. This is a result of our rebellion of death. We have declared our independence from God. We have said that we are autonomous. And in that, we have described ourselves as free. This is the great myth of freedom. And this myth of freedom is deeply rooted in the Western tradition, and it's deeply rooted in the American tradition. And we have confused independence for freedom. We think we are free because we have self-determination. But in fact... Our independence is the sign of our death because it's the way that we have disconnected from the life of God. And if we are disconnected from the life of God, then we have no life in us. And I close with this quote from Jacques Ellul, who writes, Humanity is independent. We cannot say free. Scripture everywhere reminds us that humanity's independence in relation to God is in the strict sense bondage as regards sin. This person is not free. He is under the burden of his body and his passions, the conditioning of society, culture, and function. Humans are certainly not free in any degree. They are the slave of everything, save God. See, this is the tragedy at the heart of the human rebellion, is that we were created to be truly free, but we have not believed God about what that freedom is. And so we therefore have rejected what God gave us to be. We have instead, through the knowledge of good and evil, taken upon ourselves our own determination of what we want to be free. And in that pursuit of our own freedom, according to our own knowledge of good and evil, according to our own resources, what we find is not freedom. We find loss of neighbor. We find violence we find death. The human condition and rebellion against God is a condition of death in which loving God and, and loving neighbor has now become the love of self and that is to be dead. And so what will God do with his image? How will God seek to restore his image? That's where we go in the next lecture when we look at the coming of Christ in, a, in his life from this lens of freedom and obedience and service, loving God and loving neighbor.